This is Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Follow on Twitter. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Spread it like this. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. We Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. Welcome to Marking Out Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. This is episode 705. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate each and every one of you. Go check out MarkingOut.com. Listen to us on Spotify. Also check us out over on Apple Podcasts. You can check us out on iHeartRadio. That's the one. iHeartRadio and Spotify and Amazon Podcasts. And make sure you buy a t-shirt, ProWrestlingTees.com slash out. Give us a like on Facebook. Give us a follow also on Twitter at out, On TikTok at out, On Instagram at out 11 And also check me out, David, P-T-D-P-T. That is right. You can follow Dave the Rave on all social media platforms. And also follow Brandon at B-T-T-G. And also Chris at Chris Sweendog on Twitter. And CM Sweeney 85 on Instagram. But here I go. And there he is. Hey, Brandon, how are you? I'm doing awesome as always. It's BTTG161, by the way. Yes. I left off them numbers, but how was your week? Uh, it was fantastic. It was great. How was yours? Well, I tried to replicate a barbecue sauce for a restaurant that no longer exists that refused to give me the recipe before they closed. So my brother and I ended up going to Restaurant Depot. Ever been? You've probably never been to Restaurant Depot, right? No. It is insane no, no. there. I went one time before with a friend of mine. It's really crazy that like restaurants obviously are buying their, their stock from here. So to see how busy it is and like the... It's like a factory almost. It's so weird. But we mm-hmm. went looking for the Cattleman's Barbecue Sauce base, which they didn't have. So we got the Mississippi honey barbecue sauce. I tried to add some things to it that I think the restaurant used to add in there. And I feel like it came close, but it's still not 100%. I made it a different way again, tried to replicate it, still not 100%. So it was good, but I think I need that that actual base. But hopefully one day I'll get to replicate it. So mm. I also, I went to New York City with them on Saturday, which was my first time in Grand Central Terminal. How did you like it? it it's uh, very confusing to get around in there. Mm-hmm. Very confusing. But on the way yeah, home, I, I ended up getting um, Magnolia Bakery's banana pudding. That's the best banana pudding. Mm-hmm. But when we were in, in the city, we went to Ellen's Stardust Diner. Which I hated when I was younger, and I still don't think it's a good experience. Because it's just you waiting for your server to come over to your table to help you out, take your order, yeah. get you your food, get you your refills, anything that you may need, while they go out and sing. And most of them are like Broadway's people, right? Yeah. I, well, I think they're trying to be on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it's like the service was trash. And the food was so mediocre. Mm-hmm. And then we went to Madame Tussauds. It was super hot in there. Uh, we saw the 4D movie, which was like a Marvel superhero gimmick, which Stan Lee, I'm pretty sure, was actually vocally in it. So I thought that was pretty cool. His wax figure wasn't there. And I feel like being in New York City, I feel like there should have been a lot more New York to it. Because I don't think mm-hmm. I saw like Derek Jeter. I feel like he's like a shoe in to be in in a wax museum like that kiss he used to be there i believe yeah i don't i don't think i saw him bc boys i feel like should have been there run dmc but like honestly overall i would really if you're from the area don't go go to a museum yeah it's a big a just a photo trap. op yeah and even the uh, a photo op it's like who cares yeah that's really it you the, know the rock is right outside though so that you don't have there to pay admission for <laughs> But uh, why you? Well, it's free. But your your week, you went to Chicago. Yeah, I went to Chicago, and it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I uh, got to relax a bit. Was only there for one night, 
So Which is didn't insane. really get to go into Chicago. Uh, it was like 30 minutes outside of Chicago. So, but it was good. It was a lot of fun. It was a great time. Got to celebrate uh, my friend's birthday. And then I took a beeline back over to here because I had work on Monday. But it was awesome. And something else that was awesome was SummerSlam this weekend. Taking place at an arena somewhere in Cleveland. It's a stadium, Cleveland Brown Stadium. Yes. Uh, Opening up with Jelly Roll, which I fast forward. Brandon didn't. It's very interesting because they did like a three-hour kickoff show. And I think this might have been the first time ever. I don't know if they did this for the last time. I know the last event, they went straight from the end of the event into the the panel right before the the Q&A gimmick or whatever, the media scrum. Mm -hmm. This time they went from the kickoff show right into the actual show. No, like, please be patient. We'll be right back in a minute or something like that. So I thought that was really cool, but he sang God Bless America. Then Triple H came out, welcomed everybody to SummerSlam and introduced Jelly Roll again where he performed his new single, Liar, which I I think is a, a really good song. That song I, is very I mean, catchy. That's one of us. I think it's a very catchy yeah, tune one of right us. there. But then the Miz yeah, came I don't out. Think, I don't think it is. It's, I, I, it doesn't do anything for me. I think it's a very good song. But the Miz came out, yeah. welcomed everybody to to SummerSlam as well. He's the host, and uh, we'll talk more about him in a bit. But the very first match of SummerSlam saw Liv Morgan. Pick up the victory over Rhea Ripley to retain the championship. The match started with a game of cat and mouse until Rhea Ripley faked Liv Morgan out, finally got her hands on her. This match was, like, insane. I thought that this was incredible. Um, I thought that it was a lot of fun back and forth. And I thought that I the one thing that I... Don't know if I liked so much was Rhea Ripley going with the uh, dislocated shoulder routine. Why not? So much. Huh? Why not? I don't know. I just didn't buy it. I just didn't buy it all that much. Um, it didn't do anything for me, though. Well, before before the dislocated shoulder, I liked that she hit the riptide into the turnbuckle or onto the top of the turnbuckle. But she went to hit another riptide, and Liv Morgan escaped that. She threw Rhea Ripley into the ring post, which is when that shoulder happened. Liv ends up working on Rhea Ripley's shoulder after that. Dominic Mysterio eats a suicide dive for Rhea Ripley. And Rhea Ripley goes and pops her shoulder back in by, I think, smashing her shoulder against the commentary table, if if I'm not mistaken. Was that the spot? Yeah, I think so. And then Rhea Ripley went to use a steel chair, but Dominic stopped her from using it, saying, like, you'll get DQ'd, you won't win the championship. Liv Morgan used that to her advantage. She drop kicks um, Rhea Ripley into Dominic. He falls off the apron. She hits Oblivion, but Rhea Ripley kicks out. And then Dominic slid that chair. Very much so, at that, just like that other PLE with Becky Lynch, he slides that chair into the ring. He distracts the referee. Liv Morgan hits another Oblivion, Oblivion into the onto the steel chair, right onto the chair. And one thing, like I did like it how he was stopping Rhea Ripley from using the chair too. Like I liked how it was justified. He was just like, if you use this, you're going to get DQ'd. Like I really like that it was justified. And then, of course, after the the Oblivion. Dom smirked. He always and he, smirks. And he the helped Liv he helped Liv Morgan up and he kissed her. A lot like uh Chris Jericho and Christian with Trish Stratus at WrestleMania twenty. And I think the the whole judgment day plan is falling right into place with how I saw it. It obviously happened the way it happened. Mm-hmm. And then later on I thought I uh, we saw Damian Priest furious questioned whether or not the Judgment Day knew, and he asked where Dominic Mysterio was. Finn Balor took J.D. McDonough and Carlito out to go look for him. And then we'll put a pin in that. Pinned. 
After that, we saw Braun Breaker pick up the victory over Sami Zayn to become the new Intercontinental Champion. I think uh, this match was pretty short to me, I think. I thought so too, but honestly, I would I don't think I would have wanted it to have been longer than what it was. It was already very tough for me to get into this match, so for it to be the time length that it was, I, I was very good with it. And I thought it was good. Five minutes and 40 seconds, it was by far the shortest match on the card. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought what they did in there was was very good. He, he won after hitting two spears. Breaker hit one to counter a Holuva kick, and then he hit another one to pick up that victory. And now we have this this Braun Breaker Intercontinental Championship run. Hopefully, I'm hopefully totally it's all good. for it. Hopefully it's really good. Yeah. I mean, they had the Steiner brothers in the audience too, which was pretty cool. Yeah, it was it was in the uh, Legends suite. DDP was sitting next to them. You had Sergeant Slaughter up there. Also, something that Triple H said at the media scrum, they, they sent company-wide messages out with pictures detailing who was going to be in that suite just to be like, you know, show them respect, basically. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. After that match, That's we saw LA Knight pick up the victory over Logan Paul to become the new United States champion. We saw MGK make his return to WWE for Logan Paul's entrance. LA Knight showed up in the prime truck and then busted it up. And they brawled before the match. LA Knight hit that burning hammer neck breaker on the commentary table. And I was not expecting the pre-show match fight to, or not pre-show match, the pre-match fight to happen for so long. I thought it would be mm-hmm. like a few moves or whatever. And then like the match gets started. It it was pretty long. And this match, I, I mean, it, it just, it did what it needed to do. I like that double jump elbow drop that, that LA Knight did from the corner. The, the moonsault that Logan Paul did to the outside, I thought was nuts. Apparently the IWC was like, he's copying this person and this person and this person. It's not impressive. Look at this person. Do it better. Can you give I it a I thought it was awesome. It, I thought it looked it, it looked fantastic. Logan Paul said he's never doing the move again cuz it, it looked like a it was a move that he didn't want to hurt himself on, I guess. Um, yeah, I thought that this was a very impressive move. But when, you know, when I I was very I got a little bit nervous with the I guess the brain buster kind of off the top rope. That was insane. Yeah, that superplex brain buster from LA Knight was dope. Whether yeah, or not I he intended it if, for it to be a brain buster or not, I don't, I probably yeah, not, I, but it, that looked fantastic. I got nervous on it because it looked like Logan Paul just didn't get up and over enough, and it just had to be LA Knight kind of like brute strength keeping him up there. Right. Um, uh, I did pop for Michael Cole almost saying MJF instead of In MGK. your head, though. In your head. I think that's the way it is. I don't know. I mean, uh, I did see Listen people back say to the it. same thing, but I, I don't know. Exactly. I, I mean, very possible. I mean, po- right at, right away, he, he was just like, MJ, and then he stopped himself. And then uh, I think it was McAfee. Pat McAfee intervened and said MJ, uh, MGK like really quickly to intervene on that one. So I really think he was ready to say MJF, which – is totally understandable too. I mean, it's not like these people don't know MJF at all. Right. But I mean, I thought that that was very <laughs> Michael Cole. was Michael Cole out there. I'm not sure. It might've just been triple H. No, I think Michael Cole might've been there too. I'm not hundred percent sure on that Pat McAfee show at mania when the whole fans were chanting MJF. Maybe Cole wasn't know. there. I don't know. But before that superplex spot, uh, Logan Paul at one point it knocked LA Knight out and I was like oh well that sucks that he's probably gonna win right there so I was very happy to see the match continue we saw LA Knight attack Logan Paul's friends that were sitting in the crowd and then MGK had brass knucks around a necklace around a chain that he was able to give to Logan Paul Logan Paul was able to use them but he went for the buckshot lariat and LA Knight hits that BFT to pick up the victory so, yeah, and the crowd went crazy for it too. Yeah, 
Very much so. And yeah, I, I thought it was I thought funny that when, was, when that Logan was... Paul went to go use those knucks. They were arguing. Michael Cole, I, I forget what the actual conversation was, but it was whether or not they were brass was... knuckles or whether or not it was just a necklace. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, well, for, hello. Like, it was kind of like, it was like, um, uh, who was it? Graves or, who did you say, Graves or Pat? No, I think it was Pat and Michael Cole arguing. Yeah, it may have been just Pat, but you can hear like Pat was. It reminded me very much of the like when I heard it. It reminded me very much of the barber shop scene with Bobby the Brain. Oh yeah, saying he jumped how, through. Yeah, yeah, Marty Jannetty is such a coward. He's jump. He's <laughs> trying to jump through. Uh, he threw himself through the window to escape Shawn mm-hmm. Michaels. Like it, re- it like instantly it reminded me of that. Like it sounded like Pat was going that route, that body Bobby the Brain Heenan route, and Cole was just like. Are you blind? It's brass knucks. Yeah, like, no, what are no, you it's just about? a necklace. It's clearly a necklace. It was around his exactly. Neck. Like, yeah, I thought that was I, funny. Yeah, it was definitely very entertaining. After that, we saw Nia Jax surprisingly become the new champion. She defeated Bailey. Uh, I first of all, big pop for Bailey's gear. She had like an updated version of her her old Macho Man esque gear that I. Really don't think we've seen since she murdered all her Bailey buddies. So I, I pop for that. Uh, I liked that this match had callbacks to their match at NXT TakeOver. And I was surprised to see Nia Jax hit the Annihilator. But I was even more surprised to see Bailey kick out of that first Annihilator. And then Nia yeah. Jax eventually goes for another one. Bailey counters out with a power bomb. Tiffany Stratton shows up to, in quotes, cash in. Bailey knocks her off the apron. Nia Jax then hits Bailey with two power bombs and then two more annihilators. And it was a plan between Nia Jax and Tiffany Stratton to distract Bailey and get Nia Jax that championship. I gotta say it was very crushing to see Bailey lose. No pun intended there with that finish. <laughs> um, I was very happy to see Bailey lose because I haven't been as invested within um her entire title reign right now. I and I want to see all, Nia Jax. That's, that's on WWE there. Uh, yeah, it totally is. But she I mean, won the, the title hand, and then like they didn't do anything with her. Yeah, or they didn't. But also, I'm very that. happy that Nia Jax is champion now because I want to see. I mean, me and you have said it from the start that she has come back with vengeance. She's been so good compared to uh, previously, and people have to recognize it. Yeah. So it's nice to see her get her recognition. Um, and also, I don't know if it was an intentional throwback, but. Once again, I had a trip down memory road where I had an instant throwback to Yokozuna. So when Yokozuna used to do the move where he used to do that, what is it, the Yurganami? Is that the move? Okay. Is, is I'm asking you, is that the move? I mean, it's not. What's the move that Samoa Joe does? The underarm? The, under arm, the, the Yurinagi? Yurinagi. So... Yokozuna used to do that spot in the corner with kind of similar to Yoko, to Samoa Joe with the Yurganami the and then drag them over to the turnbuckle for the Banzai drop, which is exactly what Nia Jax did, that, in, that same spot, except that was the spot that she kicked out at. So for her to go back to that spot and everything uh, and hit her with two Banzai drops, and Annihilators, whatever it is, I definitely pop for it. I was a big fan of it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Next up, you had Drew McIntyre pick up the victory over CM Punk with Seth Rollins as the referee. I like the video camera that they had on Seth Rollins. <laughs> they had it on a few referees. I, I That did not like that at all. That no? is one way to surefire get me dizzy. <laughs> no, no. I was a big fan of that. I uh, this entire match I liked right off the start where Drew McIntyre and CM Punk started fighting each other right from the start of everything started throwing punches at each other. You had them brawling on the outside of the ring where Seth Rollins was just like, um, "I am not going to pay attention. I'm going to tie my shoe." But before uh, that, despite it. despite what I think Michael Cole said, he was like, "Oh, Seth Rollins isn't even counting." I do believe Seth Rollins was counting. 
and then stop to mm-hmm. lounge on the turnbuckle like Eddie Guerrero, like Jushin Liger. And then he did his, like, the, the shoe tie spot and everything. He had the crowd singing his theme song. Mm-hmm. Then we saw McIntyre grab a steel chair to use, and CM Punk, uh, not CM Punk, Seth Rollins turns his back on it. And then at the very last second, he takes the chair, and Drew McIntyre shoves Seth Rollins, and and uh, went, and he went to hit Drew. But he mm-hmm. ducked that. He stopped before hitting CM Punk. CM Punk ends up getting that bracelet back from Drew McIntyre. That was a very big storyline feature of this program. Drew McIntyre hits him with the Claymore. And then he went for the, the GTS on McIntyre, but he saw that Seth Rollins had CM Punk's bracelet on. Seth Rollins got knocked out of the ring. Punk hits the GTS, but Seth Rollins wasn't there to count. He was knocked out of the ring. And then they argued, and Punk hit Seth Rollins with the GTS. I, I like the entire interaction and the involvement of the bracelet for this, and how Seth Rollins, like, was kind of like the innocent person. He was just watching over his bracelet for him, you know? Making sure it didn't get lost in the shuffle, so he just put it on his wrist. Yeah, and, and was... it seemed like he was trying to explain that to CM Punk, being like, no, it, like... I didn't do anything wrong, and then CM Punk just hit him with the GTS. Punk screwed Punk. Yeah, and and I like the throwback to the Shawn Michaels Undertaker Bret Hart match too. CM Punk wearing Bret Hart um, trunks too. Yeah, a lot of throwbacks, which we mentioned on the show, is very likely to happen. But then right after this, Drew McIntyre hitting the Claymore. He hit a low blow the first, though. Oh yeah, the low blow in the turn in the corner, and then hitting the Claymore to pick up the victory. Didn't expect um, that victory, and Drew walked off with the bracelet. Yeah, Drew has the bracelet again. All the while, by the way, how crazy is this? A fan made that bracelet for CM Punk, and it's yeah, become the f- the main focus of a storyline. That's just wild, you know. Wild to think about that. That's a main storyline right now. And also, that was made by a fan. Also, but, we got to give credit to Taylor Swift because I don't think friendship bracelets were such a big thing before that song came out. So, shout out T Swift. <laughs> uh, shout out why somebody getting a shout out is Gunther picking up the victory over Damian Priest to become the new champion. Uh, Gunther, so deserving, very much so. I mean. Finn Balor, though, before this match, offered up some help to Damian Priest, and Priest turned it down. Mm -hmm. Writing was on the wall, perhaps. I thought this match was pretty solid. It was pretty even. Uh, So it didn't look... Neither of them looked bad taking a loss here, if they were going to lose. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Damian Priest busted Gunther's chest open with either chops or kicks. I have to assume it was the, the... gauntlet or whatever was on priest's wrist i'm not a hundred percent sure unless Mm -hmm. it was literally just uh, busting him open via chest chop we discussed that the other week where i was like confused whether or not that was actually a, a thing that could happen uh but finn balor did show up and gunther ends up knocking him down and it allowed damian priest to recover and Damian Priest could have won after hitting that South of Heaven choke slam, but Finn Balor gets Gunther's leg on the rope, and then Priest sees that, reaches out of the ring to choke Finn Balor, and or actually before that, Gunther locked Damian Priest in that sleeper, and Priest mm-hmm. reversed it into the pin. That's when he was able to see what actually happened. And Gunther ends up locking him in the sleeper again to to knock him out. And that was a, a really good victory for Gunther. I hope this is a very, very lengthy championship run with many, many um, uh, defenses. I agree with you. I really hope that it is uh, the start of a long, lengthy uh, run for Gunther, and I think it has to be, yeah, for sure. Especially with everything that he just did with the um, the IC. Yeah, I think you know, I and and even go back to the UK. I think he has to have a very lengthy stay right now. It was also nice to see Ginny in the crowd there after the match. Mm. 
Um, true, true. After that, we saw the Awesome Truth came out to announce the attendance for SummerSlam. And I feel like as the host of SummerSlam, The Miz should have done so much more. But in this segment, Eight Town Down Under showed up. Our truth dubbed them Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson after they made fun of the after they made fun of Jelly Roll, and Jelly Roll gets into the ring with a steel chair, hits a town down under with the chair, and then he hits Austin Theory with a one handed choke slam, super high up choke slam, and then the three yeah, of he them, rocked him. yeah, and then the three of them hit the the five knuckle shuffle on Austin Theory to end that segment. So I I thought that was great. Uh, very good involvement with Jelly Roll there. And mm-hmm. he gets to live a childhood dream that we all potentially dream of. <laughs> I did think, True. though, when A-Town Down Under showed up, I thought that DIY was going to make that... I thought Gargano was going to get that hometown pop and save. Mm-hmm. But I understand the the Jelly Roll involvement over DIY, so yeah, I, can't fault yeah, them there. Sense. Then in the main event, we saw Cody yeah. Rhodes pick up the victory over Solo Sokoa in a Bloodline Rules match to retain the WWE Championship. Cody's entrance starts on on his bus. He walked with Pharaoh to the entrance. It was Pharaoh's last entrance. He's he's uh, no longer going on the road with Cody, mm-hmm. and then. Cody Rhodes runs into Arn Anderson, making his big return. Huge pop. Might have been off TV for WWE since like 2012, 2013, maybe. I don't know if he's been on since, but uh, Arn Anderson gives Cody Rhodes some advice, and he says, you have friends on the way there. The first part of this match, for a lot of it, was a normal match. So I kept waiting for those bloodline rules to kick in. And even after they used some of those rules, it went back to a normal match. And it wasn't until, I guess it was Gorillas of Destiny showing up. They Mm -hmm. beat Cody Rhodes down after a crossroads. Kevin Owens shows up. That's who Arn Anderson, a friend, was talking about. Bloodline eventually takes over. And then Randy Orton returns next. Solo Sokoa still kicked out after a second crossroads. We saw RKO go out and take care of Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa. Which that spear spot afterwards was like, to me, crazy. Because those steps, I feel like, could have landed right on either of them. On Cody or, or Solo. But Cody went to Very hit. Very true. Cody went for that trifecta. And that's when Jacob Fatu showed up. He put Cody Rhodes through the commentary table and immediately starts grabbing at his his ankle. And uh, all the the news sites now have been like, oh, he was supposed to do that. So thankful he's not actually injured. We saw... Okay, so what's the deal with... what? What's the before you go forward? What's the details with that? Because everything I saw was he was wearing a walking boot and that he actually was injured. But when I saw it... I didn't really see a good angle of him smashing his leg against there that would justify. Like I could see, understand a walking boot just to immobilize. I thought all I the didn't news sites was... were saying that even though he was wearing that, he was supposed to sell that. And I think okay, it, so I think that w- makes sense to get him out of the this this the whole picture because what happens next? You don't want Jacob Fatu there. Mm-hmm. You didn't have Tom Atanga. So this so everything with his. So he's not actually injured. I, I'm not Jacob Fatu. I can't say he's not injured, but I don't think he was actually injured. I'm not 100% okay. sure, though. But Solo, after that, hits a, a splash on Cody. Cody still kicks out. Cody hits a Cody cutter from the top rope and lefts, it leaves both of them down. And then Roman Reigns makes his big return. And he hits Solo Sokoa with that Superman punch. He hit a spear. The fans were going absolutely bananas kind of gives Cody Rhodes a head nod and then Cody hits a crossroads to pick up that victory yeah the crowd was crazy um just unbelievable it was really really cool yeah so Roman Reigns is back I'll talk more about that for Smackdown 
Moving over to Monday Night Raw from SummerSlam. Gunther opens the show, the brand new World Heavyweight Champion. uh, Gunther was introduced by Kaiser, who made his return. And Kaiser said that... Was it Kaiser? No, Gunther was saying that the company deserved more for a very long time. And he's going to be the one that makes this even more historic than his Intercontinental Championship reign. Mm-hmm. And then Gunther said nothing can can catch him off guard. He kept talking. And when he said nothing will can catch him off guard, I'm like, well, that's Wrestling 101. Obviously, somebody's coming out. Was not expecting yeah, Randy Orton to it. show up, though. And Randy Orton said that he's the only reason why Gunther's actually carrying that World Heavyweight Championship because he, in quotes, beat him at King of the Ring but not really since his shoulders weren't down. So I'm happy that they're revisiting this. Yeah, especially because this was a huge uh, talking point for everybody Yeah, after King of the Ring. And it makes sense that, like, why is a SmackDown superstar just randomly showing up on Monday Night Raw? Triple H said it. Everybody knows. And it sets up the prior... I would assume the main event for Bash in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Randy Orton versus Gunther for that World Heavyweight Championship. So, I'm happy to see that uh, with probably Gunther going over Randy Orton. Yeah. First match of the evening. I definitely see that happening. Yeah, first match of the evening. We saw Sheamus very smoothly go right into this next segment. Defeats Ludwig Kaiser. They started a brawl during Sheamus' entrance. Um, I, banger? Is that the way to describe this? After banger. I thought this was very well done. Yeah. We had a spot in the match where Ludwig Kaiser eventually calls for medical to come out and then ends up attacking Sheamus. That's heel 101. Uh, they continued pretty evenly matched. Pete Dunn showed up and tried to hit Sheamus with a shillelagh, but Sheamus dodged it. He hit him with the the knee. Ludwig Kaiser also ate a knee from Sheamus and ate a bro kick to to lose that match, but I thought this was really well done. I agree with you. I thought that this was really good. I like Kaiser getting involved with this. Uh, Well, being in the matchup, especially based off of everything that was taking place. Returning and staying Um, involved. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, big time. After that, Damian Priest, very, uh, very much so walking to the ring with a purpose, made his way out to call Finn Balor out. And he said that he can always win the championship back, but he's pissed off because Finn Balor took the championship from his family, alluding to the WWE Universe. And then Finn Balor appeared on the screen and said that Damian Priest... Damian Priest brought it upon himself because he's the one that betrayed the Judgment Day. And he brought up almost winning that championship at SummerSlam last year. And Damian Priest cost him that shot. And he told Damian Priest that he's going to wait to face Damian Priest until he feels safe and he'll strike when he doesn't expect it. And it won't just be him. And then it panned, the camera pans back. It's Dominic Mysterio. It's Liv Morgan. It's JD McDonough. It's Carlito. It's the Judgment Day. Yeah. I thought that was very much so well done. Later on, we see Damian Priest pick up the victory over JD McDonough via disqualification. Both of them had promos, which I liked. Damian Priest obviously needs this victory since it's his first post-match, post-Judgment uh, Day match. But I'm glad that this wasn't one-sided since I don't think J.D. McDonough can look weak going into this new era of the Judgment Day. 100%. I agree with you. He can't. But we saw Damian but Priest... But I like what they're doing. We saw Priest go after Carlito at one point, um, which Carlito was, like, scared I liked that spot. Damian Priest handed handled the hell out of JD McDonough. He also ends up knocking Carlito down. And in the end, it was Finn Balor who jumps Damian Priest. 
when he least expected it. And then Dominic showed up, Liv Morgan showed up, they all jumped Damian Priest. And Damian Priest somehow takes everyone out. But when he goes to hit Finn Balor with that razor's edge, Liv Morgan makes the save. And the crowd went crazy for this save too. The fight continues. And then obviously what everyone would expect happens. Rhea Ripley shows up. The place they were already hot explodes. And she went to put Liv Morgan through the commentary table, but Dominic Mysterio saved her. JD McDonough continued the attack on Damian Priest. He ran into Rhea Ripley, though, with a headbutt. Damian Priest hits that huge south of heaven to end that whole Judgment Day segment on Monday Night Raw. That was all. Yeah, this entire very well fire. Done. I agree. This was total fire. I think at Bash in as, Berlin, as I would not be surprised to see Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley versus Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan. Yeah, I can see that. I also wouldn't mind if Rhea Ripley became a tag team champion with Damian Priest to beat J.D. McDonough and Finn Balor. Hmm. Whether or not WWE is ready to go back to that era where women can do the stuff like that i don't know okay but i would 100 i'm in, i'm intrigued for that i'm not against it i think it's interesting yeah i'll give it a shot next up you had lyra valkyria pick up the victory over Shayna baszler but it was by dq I thought the match was uh, decent. Baszler just couldn't get it done by herself. Yeah, Zoe Stark jumped in. Sonya Deville jumped in. And then Damage Control ran down to brawl with them. We were supposed to see Dakota Kai versus uh, Sonya Deville. But Dakota Kai was attacked backstage right before the match. She apparently has a real injury. I don't know what the injury is, but apparently she's injured and they took her out. Yeah, that's what the rumor is. Uh, but they still Hopefully went. She's okay. They still went to the ring. Sonya Deville made fun of Dakota Kai being injured by them. Io Sky and Kyrie Sane came out instead, and Io stepped up, which led to Io Sky picking up the victory over Sonya Deville. Sonya Deville, I would f- kind of say she controlled most of this match. Yeah, but and I think that's a good spot for Sonya Deville to be in too. Yeah, and Kyrie Sane took Zoe Stark out. She took Shayna Baszler out. EO also helped with that. And with they did the, they did the um the moonsault and insane elbow drop spot. I thought that was cool at the same time. Mm-hmm. But EO wins with the moonsault. That continues damage control versus Sonya Deville, Shayna Baszler, and Zoe Stark. I don't Think we'll see Lyra Valkyria, Caden Carter, and Katana Chance in this story again? But I'm not 100% certain. Yeah. After that, we had CM Punk come out. He basically still wants Drew McIntyre. And instead of McIntyre showing up, it was Seth Rollins. And before it came to blows, Drew McIntyre showed up and said that everybody should be celebrating. And he brought up Larry. He brought up AJ Lee. And CM Punk ran to go after Drew McIntyre. Drew ends up leaving. We thought that, I mean, at least I thought that was the end of the segment. Yeah. I thought it was just going to be ending with with CM Punk chasing Drew McIntyre. Seth Rollins gets the absolute hell beaten out of him by Bronson Reed. Oh, man. Bronson this Reed. was less... Bronson Reed spoke with Adam Pierce earlier about not getting a match on Monday Night Raw and basically teasing you brought this upon yourself. Yeah, he was just like, I see what I have to do now. And then no, no explanation or anything. It's just, I see what I have to do. And what he did was he demolished... Seth Rollins, I have to say, kudos to the fan reaction as well. Crowd went, they I went popped, nuts. I I can't tell you the last time I actually heard a high pitch screech, a uh, screech, coming from the crowd of a horror like 
please don't do this any longer. I don't know, man. Reaction. By, after a while, I was after a while they were chanting one more. So <laughs> that's the thing. At first, it was like that, but then I was like, "Wow, just wow!" Yeah, he hit Seth Rollins with six tsunamis. Seth Rollins had blood coming out of his mouth. Bronson and Reed. Seth Rollins sold this like so great too. Yeah, Reed went for another one, and then. They finally got Seth out of the way, and he just posed to end that segment. But apparently, Seth Rollins might also be injured, unfortunately. So yeah, they apparently were... this was to write him off, maybe? But man, oh man, I hope they continue with that Bronson Reed. That that just like completely made him. I thought that was fantastic. I, I agree with you. And then after this segment, later on, we saw uh, CM Punk run into Adam Pearce on his hunt for Drew McIntyre. And Adam Pierce is like, he's gone. I walked Drew McIntyre out. He's gone. So that'll have a pin put into it till probably next week. Yeah. After that, the New Day next up picked up the victory over AOP, which I thought was uh, pretty dope that the New Day came out in their Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle gear to match their figures. Yeah. The match that itself cool. I thought was decent. We saw Scarlet distract the referee. We saw Karrion Cross push Xavier Woods off the top rope. And then after, I think it was like 400-something days, two years or so, Odyssey Jones, drafted once, drafted twice, finally shows up and attacks Karrion Cross. Xavier Woods gets a quick win out of that. Authors of Pain continue the attack afterwards, and Odyssey Jones just shut both of them down at the same time. Very impressive. And then he put Karrion yeah, Cross down. Yeah, they had no answer for Odyssey Jones. Yeah, and they all later on celebrated with Alpha Academy, but Xavier Woods didn't seem like he was about Odyssey Jones being there. Yeah, apparently he had no idea that about any of this. So now I have to wonder if we'll end up seeing Xavier Woods turn on New Day. I think that is what we will be seeing. But I got to say also, kudos um, to WWE because the crowd went nuts for Odyssey Jones there. So Yeah, which is surprising too, considering that this was his first appearance in... I think it was like 400 some long? days. Right? I think so. So for them to react that Maybe way. Maybe even longer hey. than 400. I don't even know how many days. Could have been like 600 days. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about how impressive how impressive that is that he did the double side sidewalk slams yeah. to AOP2 at the same time. Yeah, that was fantastic. Like, I know I can't do that. I don't think I could do that either. I mean, I don't think I know I can't do it. <laughs> No, Brandon can do no, it. I've I, seen one hundred percent. I could barely lift a toothpick at this point. Uh, after that, you should see his leg pressing. Yeah. After that, we saw a town down under from SmackDown pick up the victory over the Awesome Truth. They were allowed to be on Monday Night Raw due to what happened at SummerSlam with Jelly Roll. But another team will be allowed to go to SmackDown, which I will talk about in a moment. I have to say here. I pop big time at uh, the Awesome Truth using the double drop kicks due to the Rock and Roll Express line that was said at SummerSlam, where our Truth thought they were mm-hmm. Ricky and Robert. So I like that. I just yeah. I hated the ending of this because our Truth tagged himself in. Miz still went for the pin, not knowing our Truth tagged in. Tagged. And then R Truth hit an attitude adjustment, but knocked Miz by mistake. He gets hit by uh, Austin Theory to end that match, and I feel like maybe that's we. I was expecting A Town Down Under to be breaking up very soon. Really, very very soon. Actually, now yeah, it seems like Austin Theory gets into these positions which he probably shouldn't be in. But now it seems like. Awesome Truth might be splitting up. I wouldn't be surprised at that. Also, with the mention of Rock and Roll Express, I wish they would sign Legends deals or something and be added back to the video games. 
Mm -hmm. but that's probably not happening. I, I never knew them. What do you mean? Like, when they came to the WWE, I really had no clue who they were. Well, I feel like, how could you? You didn't have that wrestling. Exactly. So that's the thing, like, yeah. I remember back then, like, even, like, Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express and stuff like that, where he brought them in, had, like, you had everybody on commentary talking about them. Had, as a kid, I had no clue at all who they were. Right. I don't know, but... Should have done a yeah. video package. <laughs> I know. All right? After that, if we only, had... They needed you and Chris on production. Yeah, we had an interview with Braun Breaker, and he spoke about the Intercontinental Championship basically being made for him and how nobody's going to be taking his name off that title. And it should be, I think, a good run for Braun Breaker. Ilya Dragunov spoke to Sami Zayn later on. He put him over. Jay showed up and said Sammy's going to be uh, coming back from this. And he said that he'll get a rematch with Braun Breaker and win the title back. He also said that's happening next week on Monday Night Raw in a two out of three falls match. And then Jay said that they'll finish their business with the Judgment Day and become double champ. Sammy will become double champion. Mm -hmm. I don't believe any of that will actually happen, though. I don't either. Like, I, I, at some I point, I wasn't either. gonna mind Sami Zayn and Jey Uso potentially winning the titles from from uh, the Judgment Day and being tag team title mm -hmm. holders. But uh, I, at this point, I, I feel like the, the direction has changed. So, um, yeah. Earlier in the night, we saw a videotape from the Wyatt family where they showed that they debuted in Baltimore 11 years ago, that same building. So I think to have the Wyatt Six's first match in the same arena is pretty cool. Um, yeah. We also had another Wyatt video for Joe Gacy this time. Very on brand with how the Dexter Loomis video was. We also saw Chad Gable telling Ivy Nile that they don't need Maxine. They're no longer the Alpha Academy. They can keep the name or whatever and introduce them being American-made. So the Wyatt Six in the main event goes up and picks up the victory over American-made. Their entrance I liked where they had the, the Bray's chair and lantern sitting out there. This match started yeah. with a brawl where the referee didn't really have control over a lot of the first half. But we did see some unique moves from the Wyatts. We also saw, I guess... Uh, yeah, it was very... Some moves. I like the, the triple mm -hmm. moonsaults from American Maid. Yeah, I was really happy to see them cut that promo down to the ring. Um, but I love everything really about this match. And I really enjoyed that the, the reaction that they were getting from the crowd was really special and incredible. Yeah. And to end the match, Rowan hits that claw slam on Chad Gable. Joe Gacy tags in, he tags Loomis in, they hit that power bomb spot and Loomis hits the, the splash with an assist from Eric Rowan for extra oomph to pick up that victory. And then yeah. the Wyatt six celebrated their win. So, Will they translate to in-ring? Yes, they will. Yes, they did. I mean, and what, was, what was really nice is that after the air of everything, they got to celebrate, continue the celebration within the ring together in a more um, um, in, intimate sort of array. Right. Where it was really nice to see them with pointing up to the ceiling for Luke Harper and Bray Wyatt. I also when um, uh, Eric Rowan it was very nice. Eric Rowan hit that yeah 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 I like that. I know it was one of those things where like how how do you not enjoy these people you know? Yeah. How do you not? But yeah. that's Monday Night Raw moving over to NXT, which kicked off with Pete Dunn picking up the victory over Trick Williams. Decent match big win for pete dunn 
I was hoping that it was going to be a bit more aggressive, but I'm happy to see Pete Dunn pick up that victory. I was not expecting that outcome. No. And then later on, Pete Dunn said that Trick Williams isn't ready for the championship. And he is ready for the championship. And then Trick attacked him. So it's clearly not done between Pete Dunn and, and Trick Williams. After Man. that, we saw Kalani Jordan pick Kalani. up the victory over Tatum Paxley to retain the North American Championship. Both of them have such unique move sets, and I think it made for a very fun match between the two of them. Yeah, I I thought that was a solid match, especially uh, coming off of the Trick Williams Dunn match, and Tatum Paxley. I don't know. I hope she's okay after that match. Well, looks like she got taken out. Before that, Maybe. she she went under the ring at one point, and Kalani Jordan lifted the ring skirt to reveal the Barbie doll of her, and then Wendy Chu eventually made her way out, but didn't affect the match. Kalani's leg was messed up in the match. She still continued and won the match with a one-legged frog splash. Very impressive. And then afterwards, Wendy Chu handed that Barbie doll back to Tatum Paxley, and then choked her out. Yeah. Wasn't expecting that. Very interesting to see where they're going with that. Yeah. Next up, you had Ethan Page successfully defend his championship against Oro Mensa. Um, didn't expect Oro Mensa to pick up the victory. But... No, but for this to have been building for weeks, I feel like this should have been also more aggressive. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very lackluster for me. But Ethan Page ended up putting Oro Mensa through a picnic table on the stage. It was Great American Bash. I didn't mention that. They did have Oro Mensa almost win, but Ethan Page's foot was under the rope, and Ethan Page won after a second Ego's Edge. Who's next for Ethan Page? Yeah. We don't know yet. We do not know. But say his name, and he appears... Joe Hendry picked up the victory over Joe Coffey. Joe versus Joe. And I got to say, this is definitely NXT's cup of coffee because they ate up Joe Hendry like crazy. Isn't cup of coffee They're... not a good thing? I don't... I, 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 <laughs> he was there for a cup I, of coffee? I, yeah, he's there for a cup of coffee. But... Uh, well, because he was facing Joe Coffey. Joe Coffey brought Hendry's broken guitar out with him and he stomped on it more to, like, start the whole segment. And then I like Joe Hendry dove onto Gallus before the match. He was, like, right out of hitting his yeah, pose. and that dive was very unique, too. It was right out of hitting his pose. Well, yeah, it wasn't even like it wasn't even a running dive. It was just like a, it was kind of like a Orange Cassidy ish, just it was up nonchalant and down. jump over the rope. The match also huh? it was uh, pretty evenly matched, but Gallus did get involved. Joe Hendry ends up pulling an Eddie Guerrero, and got them booted from ringside. Yeah, the chair shot. Spot. I like the crowd well, involvement. To... The crowd involvement towards the end, I thought was nice. But mm -hmm. I, he was interviewed afterwards, and he said that he likes NXT and might just stay a lot longer. And issued an open Makes... challenge for next week's episode. I was fully expecting for somebody to show up, and like we would know who's <laughs> challenging him next week or something like that. But. That didn't and happen. That's the thing. That, I did not expect that. I mean, I'm looking yeah, forward. Now. I didn't expect that at all. Yeah, I was 100 percent expecting that. Well, so, I'm, yeah, I'm glad I that let... we'll have that surprise when we have it. Hopefully, it's a surprise. I hope it's not like one of those like backstage things where it's like not a surprise. They're like they show up and they're like, mm -hmm. "Well, I'll do it," and it's like yeah. somebody in no, NXT. I definitely or think that it's definitely good to have Joe Henry walk out on uh, on this victory. And we're going to see what happens next week. But next up, you had Ren Sinclair pick up the victory over Kendall Gray. Um, both uh, have a bright future with NXT, you know, both young in the careers. Tony D'Angelo. I thought it was good. D'Angelo told Charlie Dempsey that if Ren Sinclair wins her match, he'll give him another title, uh, another Heritage Cup shot. And we saw Miles Bourne get involved here. 
Charlie Dempsey almost got involved, and at the last second, he decided not to. And Ren Sinclair was able to reverse the pin on her own, get that victory. They all posed afterwards. So even though Charlie Dempsey's been fighting this for weeks, it seems like he'll he's finally accepted Ren Sinclair. I mean, he said if she wins, she's in, I believe. So mm-hmm. she is now officially in no quarter catch crew. Um, we saw a segment with Chase U where Thea Hale and Duke Hudson were like in very low spirits after not having won gold. They had a new classroom thanks to Ridge Holland. And he announced to the class that he got them uh, a tag title shot for Chase U next week. And it turns out it's going to be for Ridge and Andre Chase. I don't think this is the end of the title run for Axiom and Nathan Fraser. I think that it's coming to an end soon, though. Well, I thought maybe it was coming to an end in the main event. Something else came to an end. But before we talk about that, Nathan Fraser and Axiom picked up the victory over MSK to retain the Tag Team Championships. Very, very good match. And it really, to me, it could have gone either way. Even with Zachary Mm -hmm. Wentz being in TNA, I could have seen them give the championship to him. But, and also we saw Axiom accidentally kicks Nathan Fraser. I thought for sure MSK was going to win that. They had me eating out of the palm of their hands here. MSK took advantage of that, almost gets the victory. But the champions came back from that. Wes Lee kicks out. But Axiom at the very end, hits another golden ratio and picks up the victory. Hmm. I have to assume we're going to see them lose the titles at probably the next big uh, NXT event. Is it? I think it might be NXT No Mercy. Not 100% sure. I, I mean, I think it's definitely going to happen. Especially because you had everything with Nathan Fraser had no clue where Axiom was even. Like before their match, right, he was yeah. like he was trying to find him. Yeah, I think s- September first in Denver, Colorado. I think we'll see titles change hands. And I, if I mean, I said it the other week. If those rumors are true, I feel like how could it not be Motor City Machine Guns? Yeah, I mean. Hey, maybe it's going to end up being Lucha Bros. Nah, that's there's no way they're going to NXT. Um, uh, there's no way they're going to NXT. I re- why? I would be very shocked if Lucha Brothers ended up in NXT versus main roster. I could definitely see them start with NXT. Nah, there's no way they would go from being on TV for for a main roster to NXT. Hmm. All right. But to end NXT, Wesley turned on Zachary Wentz and, and Trey Miguel and said, you left right. me alone. Very true. It makes sense. They did. I mean, Zachary Wentz had no choice to, to but to leave him alone. Trey Miguel did what's best for his family, he said. They they did leave him in NXT by himself. Yeah. Was not expecting to see That's the Rascals sure. break up like that. No. But it does make sense that it that Wesley did do that. Unless we're just trying to make sense you of him. <laughs> yeah, it's very true too. Maybe we just want to make sense we're, of we're him. We're in goddamn it's denial. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, it was very, yeah, that was very so very shocking for us to accept. It was very shocking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's NXT moving <laughs> over to SmackDown. It opened up with Cody Rhodes, and he said he's been thinking about who he wants to defend the championship against at Bash in Berlin. But he was interrupted by the Bloodline and Solo Sokoa said he wants a rematch, and Cody better give him the rematch. To which Cody said he's delusional if he thinks he's getting a rematch. And then the bloodline got up on the apron and Kevin Owens showed up behind Cody Rhodes with steel chairs and they backed off. Solo Sokoa said he'll deal with him later. So I'll put a pin in that. 
Cody addressed what he wanted, uh, who he was wanting to defend the championship against, and that being Kevin Owens at Bash in Berlin. And Kevin said he doesn't think he deserves a title shot. He doesn't want it. And Cody said he thinks he does, and he's going to go talk to Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis then said he's going to give Roman Reigns the... He was thinking about giving Roman Reigns the, the match. And Kevin Owens was very adamant about not giving Roman Reigns the match, as he doesn't deserve it. And Nick Aldis was like, well... I think you deserve it. The fans think you deserve it. Cody thinks you deserve it. So he makes the match for Bastion Berlin between Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens. I'm looking forward to seeing that match. We saw the Street Profits pick up the victory over A-Town down under to advance in a number one contender gimmick. I don't know. It's not a tournament. I don't know what you're calling it, though. But... They had a good interview with the Street Profits before the match. We did see Grayson Waller tag himself in, which Austin Theory didn't like. And he ends up getting shut down. They continue the match. Dawkins gets a blind tag at the end of the match. And uh, they reversed Austin Theory's finisher. And the Street Profits won with the Doomsday Blockbuster. Later on, Grayson Waller and Austin Theory complained to Nick Aldis. And... Austin Theory was like, it seems like all you have to do around here is say, oh, such and such match. And he rattles off uh, Grayson Waller versus Kevin Owens. And then Nick Aldis is like, oh, I like the sound of that. That's a match next week. So I thought that was pretty funny. Backstage, we saw Tiffany Stratton walking around where she was planning a celebration for Nia Jax next week. Pretty Deadly asked her to plan their victory party when they win later on. Uh, And then Chelsea Green and Piper Niven showed up and they went back and forth with jabs at each other. Chelsea said it's clear that Tiffany Stratton wants to cash in on Nia Jax. I think, I don't know about that, but it seems like, I hope Tiffany Stratton doesn't lose the briefcase is what I, I, uh, I hope. After that, Jade Cargill picked up the victory over Alba Fire, which was a very quick match. It was decent to put Jade Cargill over. Not what I want from Alba Fire, though. But Blair Davenport showed up afterwards to jump the former champions. Naomi made the save. This whole segment went exactly how I thought it would. Um, And we have the big three reunite. After that, LA Knight came out for his championship promo or celebration, whatever you want to call it. Lou Ferrigno was in the crowd for this. I popped for that. I thought that was pretty cool. But LA Knight comes out, updated entrance uh, theme. It's like a new version of his other theme song. I don't hate it. And he spoke about being champion and how he knows that there's a target on his back now. Santos Escobar interrupted and said that he's going to become champion. I liked his promo. With the, everybody's going to be saying Escobar C. I thought that was very clever. And uh, LA Knight said he's not going to let anybody take the title from him. Andrade came out for his match with Santos Escobar picked up the victory over Andrade to become number one contender. Um, Corbin and Cruz showed up to brawl with Los Lotharios, get them away from ringside. It was a pretty even match. I like that Poison Rana from Escobar off the middle rope, but Carmelo Hayes showed up. That distracted Andrade. He was able to come back from that, hit that back elbow, but um, Electra Lopez distracted the referee. Carmelo Hayes prevented uh, Santos Escobar from getting hit with those knees from, from Andrade. And then Escobar was able to get the victory off of that. Rolls Andrade up, grabs the tights to pick up that victory. They aired a video package for Giovanni Vinci. Finally, it was all in Italian, by the way. So it seems like they're going back to that old gimmick that he had. But I'm happy that they're doing something with Giovanni Vinci. Finally, I'm looking forward to seeing him wrestle again. After that, WWE paid tribute to Kevin Sullivan, who passed away this week at the age of 74. It was a very good video package. But Kevin Sullivan was the booker in WCW and had one of the best minds in pro wrestling with a lot of unique ideas. 
He led factions like the Army of Darkness, Dungeon of Doom. He led the Varsity Club. He held championships in ECW with Taz. He held championships in WCW with Cactus Jack and Dr. Death. So many other places as well. His last match was actually in 2019 against Brian Pillman Jr., Lexus King in NXT. I think that's pretty significant because there was that incident with Brian Pillman in WCW where he takes the mic and flat out calls him the Booker Man. Commentary completely ignores it. But I think it's cool that Brian Pillman Jr. and Kevin Sullivan actually had that match. Last year, Karrion Cross released a video with Kevin Sullivan that a lot of people at first thought was an official video from WWE, but then it turned out to not be part of WWE's storyline. But I really wish it was because it was such a natural fit to have him there with Kevin Sullivan, uh, with Karrion Cross, And it was, it was a very well done video there. So our condolences go out to Kevin Sullivan's family and his friends go on the WWE network, go on Peacock, watch his matches, go watch all his like shoot interview stuff where you get to go into his mind. Uh, I think those those videos out there are like must watch videos for for I guess wrestlers and wrestling fans who want a, a peek behind the curtain. In the main event of SmackDown, the DIY picked up the victory over Pretty Deadly to advance in that number one contender gimmick. This was, I think, exactly how you would have expected it to go. Pretty Deadly did have some offense, but it was a pretty quick match. And now DIY goes on to face the Street Profits to see who will become the number one contenders. I did not want DIY to lose the championships, but I would like to see the Street Profits win this and then go on to face the Bloodline. And and then SmackDown ends with the Bloodline. Solo Sokoa told Roman Reigns that he's the tribal chief now. And if Roman calls himself that, he and he wants the Ula Fala back, then he should come and get it. Roman Reigns came out. Solo sent Gorillas of Destiny after him. They get shut down. Roman and Solo Sokoa square up a bit. He gets hit with a Superman punch, and then Tongaloa saved him before he got hit with that spear. The Ula Fala was left in the ring, and Roman Reigns picked it up, but Tama Tonga and Tongaloa jumped on him. Tama gave Solo Sokoa the Ula Fala back. Solo takes off. And then Roman Reigns beats the hell out of Tama Tonga and Tongaloa. He speared Tama Tonga through the, the, the barricade. He beat the hell out of Tongaloa with a steel chair. And this crowd was going absolutely nuts. This whole segment. OTC chants were in the beginning of the night. Fox, for whatever reason, bleeping it. Very annoying. Maybe they thought it was a curse word. I would assume that's what they thought. This whole segment in the the main event, uh, the closing of SmackDown, the OTC chants, original Tribal Chief chants. Fantastic. This was a a really great crowd tonight. Uh, And a hot ending to SmackDown. Going to take a quick little break right now. And I'll be right back here on Marking Out. This is the greatest tag team of all time, FTR. And we're here on Marking Out Podcast. You got Cash here, one half of the living legends, one half of FTR, one half of the seven star icons. And we think you should check out this podcast here, Marking Out. Top guys, out. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Marking Out episode 705. Going back to last week's AEW Rampage, it kicked off with Wheeler Yuta picking up the victory over the Butcher. This was another match to build Wheeler Yuta back up. I thought it was a decent match. The power bomb from the Butcher I thought was was probably my favorite part of this match. But Wheeler Yuta worked on the Butcher's arm during this match. He won with the cattle mutilation. That just furthers the relationship between him and Brian Danielson. Perfectly sets up um, the end of Dynamite. I'll get to that in a moment. We saw Nyla Rose pick up the victory over Harley Cameron. Soraya wants to wrestle at all in, but has been treated like garbage by AEW. So Harley stepped in out of protest. 
And based on that, I thought this match was going to be over quickly, but it was a lot longer than I expected. Pretty evenly matched as well. The finish of this saw Harley Cameron hit a Bronco Buster on Nyla Rose. Nyla picked her up and hit a powerbomb to pick up the victory. And I I gotta say, I wonder if that ever happened to X-Pac. I don't remember that ever happening. We saw Brian Keith pick up the victory over Jackson Drake. I thought it was goofy that this went as long as it did. Even, I mean, you had Big Bill interfere even. I don't feel like this match should have been anything more than like 10 seconds. We saw Maximum Male Models pick up the victory of the private party. Don't mean the private party, just private party. I I didn't like that uh, promo from Maximum Male Models. For them to quote CM Punk in their promo earlier, I thought that was kind of cringe. Private party though, they've fallen so far down the card. But if they're going to be pushing Maximum Male Models in AEW... At least they beat a team that was signed to AEW. And at least the match wasn't like a quick match that makes Private Party look even worse than they are right now. Um, the hot tag sequence for Mark Quinn was nice. The the catching boss man slam from Mace I thought was good. I thought it was goofy that the referee didn't care about him hitting Mark Quinn. To lead to the end of the match with Mansoor. But what what are you going to do? That's AEW officiating. Moving over to AEW Collision. It opened up with the patriarchy. Christian gave off, I think, big Matt Cardona vibes in this promo. Like this could have 100% been a Matt Cardona thing word for word. He spoke about how they don't have belts. Their championship titles. And then Christian presented the, the one title to Nick. And it looked like he was going to present the other title to Killswitch. Killswitch is a disappointment. He presented it to Shayna instead. So Shayna holds one of those titles, even though she's not officially champion. House of Black came out. Christian ran his mouth. And then the lights went out. The whole thing with Christian running his mouth is like, oh, well, you're two and we're three. Buddy Matthews returned. And then the Bang Bang gang showed up after that. Kip Sabian stopped Nick Wayne from escaping. And the Bang Bang gang threw Nick Wayne into the ring with House of Black. They hit him with Cerberus to take him out. And then both teams held on to the title. Not a tug of war officially, but... It, it signifies that they're going to want a match or whatever. And, and that gets set up for collision, I guess, for next week. Well, I mean, this week's, but I'll speak about it next week. We saw Hologram team up with Mystico to pick up the victory of the Premier Athletes, which I think is puzzling. You're trying to build up Hologram as a single star, but then you have him team up to face a team that hasn't beaten a single signed talent since 2022. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know if they're worried about Hologram maybe having too similar of a match week after week for him to maybe grow out of that. But then you look at Mystico and he's basically doing the same things. So I don't understand this booking to put them two together here. After that, Tony Storm picked up the victory over Chanel. Mariah May was on commentary. But Tony Storm attacked her. They brawled. I don't think this was a match that Tony Storm needed at all. And I'll get to that with Mariah May in a moment. After that, Claudio picked up the victory over Ishii and Lee Moriarty. This was to get a shot at the Continental Championship, which Okada really has not done anything that memorable in AEW so far. So I really can't wait to see him lose that championship. I don't see Claudio being the one to beat him. I don't see Okada losing that championship anytime soon. After that, Thunder Rosa picked up the victory over Ty of Valkyrie. Thunder Rosa super fired up for this match. I think it would have been nice to see Taya pick up some wins again. 
It's been over a year since her last win on TV. But Thunder Rosa made her tap out, and then she challenged Deanna Perrazzo to a Texas bull rope match, which I'll talk about next week. Main event saw FTR, Darby Allen, and Mark Briscoe pick up the victory over the Undisputed Kingdom and Black Taurus. I, I really don't understand why Black Taurus is randomly with Roderick Strong. Again, I don't get that pairing. But the main thing to mention from this was that the acclaimed interrupted Dax after the match. Dax was cutting like an off-air promo, but on-air. And... Max Caster questioned where FTR have been while they've been fighting the Bucks. They've been Team AEW. Where has FTR been? They don't know. And he also said that they're not good enough to be on the show without Darby as their partner, which led to a scrap. Mark Briscoe stepped in between them to like break it up. And Billy Gunn pulled them away when Dax offered a handshake. So it seems like the acclaimed will probably be turning heel soon. Something else that took place on Rampage going back to it. Brian Cage beat Manny Lowe in like 10 seconds. Which I think obviously happened because Brian Cage was facing Kyle Fletcher on collision. And you need to build Brian Cage up since his last victory against somebody signed in AEW was back in May. So Brian Cage gets that win. You fast forward to Collision, Kyle Fletcher gets a victory over Brian Cage. Which obviously happened because Kyle Fletcher was facing MJF on Dynamite. Kyle Fletcher spoke after that. He challenged MJF to put the title on the line. MJF interrupted and he agreed to an Eliminator match instead. And then we get to the opening contest of AEW Dynamite where MJF picks up the victory over Kyle Fletcher. I think MJF tweeted he had to like drive maybe 11 hours or something to get to Dynamite due to all the uh, the flights being canceled for the, the hurricane. So I think that's crazy. Good on MJF for making the, the show. I assume his gear was based on Kurt Angle's SummerSlam 2002 gear. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I thought this was a decent match. MJF earlier on went off, went for that, that kangaroo kick. Kyle Fletcher reversed it. They went over like 20 minutes or so. And Don Callis, it comes to a moment, gives Kyle Fletcher a screwdriver to use. He's distracting the referee. Kyle Fletcher refused to use that screwdriver. And instead, MJF low blows him. Finally gets that kangaroo kick. Hits a brain buster to pick up the victory. And Osprey's locker room, it it cuts to the back. We see he was uh, barricaded in, I guess. He escapes. MJF knocks the official out with the championship. And then he hits Kyle Fletcher with the, the ring. Busts him open. Goes to hit the Tiger Driver 91, but Will Ospreay ran down to make the save. I feel like if MJF, putting your hands on an official is one thing. Using the championship, how is that not a 30-day suspension? At least. I think that's, and everything like off-air that's going on with the suspensions, I think it's even goofier to do something like that. Not going to get into the suspensions. If you know, you know. I'm sure you've read about it. After that, Mariah May picked up the victory over Viva Van. I, I, I don't think beating somebody who isn't signed to AEW does anything for someone challenging for a championship. And really the main thing here to note, Mariah May hit Storm Zero to pick up the victory. She receives a gift, which was a picture. And on the back, it said, Die, Mariah, die. And then Tony Storm jumped her and they fought. I thought it was a good aftermath to this match. I just don't think Tony Storm and Mariah May are having the matches to build them up to face each other. It doesn't make sense to me. After that, Shibata picked up the victory over Brian Keith. Nobody reacted when Brian Keith's music hit. I didn't even realize it was him coming out because I have not heard his theme song In a bunch of weeks, Jericho came out afterwards with Big Bill for commentary. 
And I feel like if you're going to have Jericho come out, just use the learning tree, the full entrance. But after the match, the learning tree attacks Shibata. I fully expected during the match to see Hook return. And the fans are chanting for Hook. Right before Chris Jericho used that championship to hit Shibata with, Hook makes the save. And even though most of this learning tree stuff has been like pure garbage, I think Hook looked really good squaring up with Chris Jericho in that segment there. After that, Orange Cassidy and FTR picked up the victory over Roderick Strong, Black Taurus, and Roosh. The rest of the conglomeration couldn't make it due to the hurricane. Um, I was also surprised to hear that this was the first time Orange Cassidy and FTR shared a ring together. I thought that was pretty crazy. But the kingdom got involved behind the referee's back. We saw Orange Cassidy and Black Taurus repeat that Tornado DDT spot that they didn't land the other week. It also, it didn't seem so like super smooth again this week, but it's still a really cool, like the, the rotations that Orange Cassidy gets in that move is insane. Um, the aftermath though, we saw the Acclaim come out. They tried to fight with FTR, but it was it was broken up and that was that. We saw Camille pick up the victory over Jasmine Howe and Clara Carter, which I don't think the enhancement talent needed to get any sort of offense in this. It could have just been like a complete squash match. The bigger thing, Mercedes cuts a promo afterwards. Tony Schiavone interrupts and said Tony Khan lifted Britt Baker's suspension and she's there via satellite. And then she makes a reference to Sasha Banks taking her ball and going home, basically. I don't think that was necessary. The rest of Britt Baker's promo, I thought, was was actually really good. Earlier in the night, we saw Swerve have a sit-down interview with Jim Ross about his match at All In. And Swerve said he doesn't care about Brian Danielson becoming a parent or going home to be a parent. He doesn't care about the promises that he made to Bree. And he doesn't think that this is going to be his hardest match. Which I just don't buy anything that Swerve said. But at least Swerve believes he's the main event. I just don't believe he's the main event. And then the main event, we see Brian Danielson pick up the victory over Jeff Jarrett in an Anything Goes match. Ricky Steamboat was on commentary. We saw Jeff Jarrett break a guitar over Brian's back during his entrance. They fought in the crowd. They fought near the concessions. Storyline-wise, I thought this was dumb. Brian said the doctors told him he should not be wrestling at all. (laughs) And now he's in an anything goes match. I don't understand how that makes any sense. The match itself, though, I thought was pretty dope. This might have been one of Jeff Jarrett's best matches in, uh, in AEW. And I like the finish. Brian hit that running knee with the chair to pick up the victory. Afterwards, they all celebrated. Ricky Steamboat, Triple J, Wheeler Yuta came out. And they were all just celebrating. It could have been the perfect close to AW Dynamite. However, Swerve interrupts and he referred to Double J, Ricky Steamboat, and himself as legends. It made it seem like he was referring to Brian Danielson. But then he goes on to say that they've all been champions in AEW on like Brian Danielson. Unless I heard it completely wrong. Which I went back and listened to it and he says something like that. So I don't understand what he's talking about there. But Swerve ends Dynamite by saying since Brian Danielson has this warm up match between now and all in. He wants one and he's going to be facing Wheeler Yuta. So, do I think Brian Danielson versus Jeff Jarrett is the equivalent of Swerve versus versus Wheeler Yuta? Not at all. Do I think Swerve should run right through Wheeler Yuta? Yes, 100%. Will that happen? No, they'll probably go around 15, 20 minutes. And I'm sure it'll be a fine match. So, that's AEW Dynamite. Hey, Brandon, got any shout outs? Damn it, Bobby, how many times do I have to tell you to listen to Brandon's shout-outs? 
The first shout out goes to Unstable. It's back on Netflix for season two. It stars Rob Lowe and his son, John Owen. I really enjoyed the first season and I hoped that it got picked up for a second season. And then I completely forgot that the show existed. So I was happy to see it pop up a few weeks ago saying it was coming out soon. And now it's out the second season. It's very, I think it's one of those shows that you could literally just sit and binge watch. So if you're a fan of TV comedy sitcoms or whatever, it's not really a sitcom. It might be classified Mm -hmm. as one though. I think it's a good show. Uh, My next shout out, it's really, it's no different with uh, the A and E biographies that they've been doing. So I'm giving another shout out to it. They did Trish Stratus and Becky Lynch this week. Both I thought were very well done. Both, of course, I wish were a lot longer. But they packed a lot mm-hmm. into each hour for, for Trish and Becky Lynch. So, and I got, I learned stuff that I don't think I knew about Trish Stratus. I saw stuff with Becky Lynch that I, I, I thought was very good. Check it out on A&E, wherever you could stream it. I think if you have a deal with Hulu, you might be able to see it. I'm not 100% sure. And then my last shout-out goes to WWE 24, Damian Priest, which was, again, very, very well done. The WWE 24 documentaries that they do are always very good, and I hate that we barely get them anymore. So that sucks, but this documentary I thought was great. I really hope it makes people appreciate Damian Priest even more. And honestly, with everything that happened with the Judgment Day this week, I want to acknowledge Edge. He's brought up in the the documentary. He brought them together. And even though that Mm. iteration of the group was so short-lived, what everyone was able to accomplish in these past two years, I... Don't think that's something that's going to be forgotten. After Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley ditched Edge, obviously Dominic Mysterio joins, but Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan now both held the the championship. Dominic Mysterio had the North American Championship twice. Finn Balor and Damian Priest were the tag team champions. Obviously Balor and, and JD McDonough are the tag team champions now. Finn Balor got to be a Grand Slam champion out of this. Rhea Ripley became a triple crown and Grand Slam champion out of the Judgment Day. She also won the Royal Rumble. Damian Priest won the Money in the Bank. He won the World Heavyweight Championship with the Judgment Day. So, nah. I really hope people go watch the, the 24 documentary on Damian Priest. And all in all, I'm just very, very, very happy with what's going on with with the the storyline with the Judgment Day, I agree with you. I think everything that they're doing uh, Judgment Day is fantastic. And from what I heard, I didn't see it, but I heard that the biography was really awesome too. I think really with the Judgment Day, the one like really really good thing that they could, I mean, it's not feasible. I think at this point, I think the coolest thing that they could do or if they were able to do it, was to have Edge return mm-hmm. and and go back with Priest and Rhea Ripley to combat huh. the rest of them. But I obviously, Edge was out with that broken leg or whatever. and That's an interesting... And not in WWE, so... Yeah, yeah. But those are my shout-outs. Now it's time for our... That is right, our mark out moment of the week. I think for me, I really just have that one mark out moment, which was, I mean, not to say everything else was like not worthy of a mark out moment. Mm -hmm. It was just very unexpected to see that stuff with Jelly Roll. That choke slam I thought was one of the best choke slams we've ever seen. Probably because of Austin Theory, but I thought that was fantastic. Uh, I marked out for beating CM Punk's uh, hometown, even though I wasn't in his hometown, but the airport. According to WWE, uh, you were. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Um, but I did mark out because during the Olympics, they did play John Cena's theme song on the speaker at one point. Uh, I definitely, I heard in the background, I totally marked out for that, for them playing John Cena's theme song. Um, yeah. Outside of that, everything with SummerSlam marked out huge. Roman Reigns, the return. How do you not mark out over that moment? Uh, just seeing the crowd react to him, seeing him showing up. Uh, yeah, I totally marked out for Roman Reigns. And I marked out for everything with the White family with their closing of uh, Monday Night Raw. Another mark out moment for me. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So that's the yeah. uh, the mark out moment of the week. And that is episode 705. Thank you so much for listening this week. You can follow us on Twitter at Marking Out, at BTTG161 on all platforms. Chris Sweendog, CM Sweeney85. David PTDPT on all platforms. Facebook.com slash Marking Out. Marking Out 11 on Instagram. YouTube is Marking Out 11 as well. You could go buy some merch at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Marking Out. Follow us on TikTok at Marking Out. Check out the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify Podcasts, MarkingOut.com, wherever you stream a podcast or listen to a podcast. You can listen to it, I assume. And we wish you the... The... Best of luck in your future endeavors. Your future endeavors. Have a fantastic day.